Um, all right, uh, we're at last week, or two weeks ago, last time we met, um, we were looking at the plagues uh, one through nine. Just a brief recap before we pray. They, uh, they follow a pattern. Um, uh, one through four, or one, two, and three, uh, have to do with both the Egyptians and the children of Israel. Uh, or the Hebrews, and then uh, four is a pivotal one because it's where they're separated, where the plagues then affect Egypt, but they don't affect the Hebrews, and, and that exists four through nine. All of them have to deal in some form or fashion with the religious culture of Egypt uh, because of the way they're, the uh, the way the deities are seen. They are. Uh, described um, with human bodies and animal heads uh, and there's there's very strategic in how the plagues address the the power structure inside of Egypt and uh, so keep in mind the larger context is who ultimately will be the person of power uh, will it be Pharaoh or will it be uh, be God and the uh, the plagues is you know the uh, the you know the ten ten rounds of you know ten rounds of seeing who's going to win, and uh, and so we're we finished uh, one through nine, and so now we're ready for the tenth plague, which we know is uh, the Passover, um, and we're going to look at that today. But before we do, uh, let's pray, and then I want to address this issue about Pharaoh's heart. We've postponed that for, for a while, because, uh, uh, it, but it's now a good time to, to deal with it. So let's pray, and then we'll begin. Oh God, as we gather uh, again in your name, we're grateful. We give thanks uh, for your mercy, for your grace. We pray, Lord, uh, for a couple things. The, the people that we have mentioned and, and the situations there, and then also uh, the ones that we will write down on our, on our pad and then just a host of others that we uh, were mindful of, uh, we lift them up to you. Um, it's, it's really shallow, and at the same time, it, would be, uh, it, it just would be difficult to gather in your name and to not acknowledge what the people that make us who we are, the concerns that we have. Uh, and so as a part of our faith and as a part of our reflection and study, um, we bring these people to you and uh, ask for your continued healing. Uh, we, what we pray for is your presence uh, in their life in such a way that it brings wholeness uh, in, in the fullness of that word. At the same time, for uh, these moments together and then for the events of this day and the, and the week to come, uh, we ask for your guidance. Um, again, it seems a little foolish for us to ask for your guidance uh, because that's part of your nature to guide your children and so maybe the prayer should be not so much for you to guide us as much as for us to be open to be guided and so uh, work in us this way oh God we pray and we ask it in the name of Christ amen all right uh, so we have this whole issue around Pharaoh's heart and at least in a number of different ways or we've seen it listed three different ways. We've seen the hardening of Pharaoh's heart as something that Pharaoh does. We see it in sort of like a, a neutral stance. The heart was hardened. And then there have been times where we have seen in the text where God has hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, for instance, in 934, we see that Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh himself hardens his own heart. In 935, the heart was hardened. And then in 10.1, we see that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. These, are, these aren't the only examples. These are just examples of each of the three. But up until now, at least when we started dealing with the plagues, um, we've got this whole concept around Pharaoh's heart. And so, uh, you know, obviously the, 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 the object of, you know, the, the, the one whose heart, well, who ultimately is doing this? Is it something that Pharaoh's doing? Is it something that God is doing? You know, is it something that just happens over time? Uh, I mean, what are we to make of this? Um, because if it's, if it's something that God is doing, then that sounds, uh, that's probably difficult to swallow. 
that there would be people that God, that are, that are alive, that are created, and they become puppets. Uh, I mean, you know, there's a, at least from my perspective, there's a part of me that says, uh, well, Shane was created for a purpose to, to you, you know, to, to be destroyed. Uh, you know, h- how do we balance that with grace and mercy? I mean, what, what do we make with all this? And, uh, you know, if at least those that sit with the Armenian side of, of the, the lens, uh, the Armenian lens of theology has a heavy uh, view or a heavy acceptance with the idea of choice. Um, God can be active, and God can be active in all, in all people. And the idea is that, you know, people choose. People see what's in front of them. Uh, to whatever degree that they can can process that, and they choose one way or the other. Um, you know that that's a level of you, you know Methodist, Baptist. Uh, I mean they're, they're fairly Armenian in the way they approach humanity, and uh, um, and, and so you know probably for a number of Protestants, the idea of being able to you know God not being the primary agent that hardens, uh, but to allowing, you know, there's things that happen, uh, and then allowing people to choose, you know, that, that's more home cooking for us, if I had to guess. Now, y'all can tell me if that's not right, um, uh, as compared to other sides of the church that would say, that are very comfortable with, well, God can do whatever God wants to do. If God wants to harden somebody's heart, then so be it. Who are we to question? And, you know, and there's, there's some, all right, that makes sense, too. I mean, you know, we can read certain parts of the Scripture and, and come to that conclusion. Uh, just personally for me, I'll speak first person. That, that's, I hope that's not the case. I don't like that. And, uh, but I'm, so what do we make of this? Uh, is it Pharaoh that hardens his heart? His, or is it just his heart is hardened, uh, kind of neutral in the subject, or does God harden the heart? And uh, so... What I want to do is I, I want to give you what I think is going on inside of Pharaoh. And then we can, you can push back or, or pick apart and, uh, um, and we can just kind of go from there. I, I'm going to argue from what I see inside of the lives of other people outside of just Pharaoh and what goes on. Uh, so when we look at these, we see that at least in the text, the words that are used, they, they are a... Uh, they do come with at least some level of choices because Pharaoh is given opportunity to make decisions. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that we've noticed in, in the plagues is that obviously there are judgments that are made by God, but the judgments are limited, which means that there's a great deal of grace that shows up in the plagues. For instance, when plague one takes place, uh, the blood, in, I mean, the Nile turning to blood, or, or in plague, you know, that, that is a self-contained plague. It's not always the Nile turning to blood for the rest of the duration. It has a start time, it has an end time. And, uh, and we noticed that about all the plagues. And, uh, and one of the things that we discover, too, is that there are times where Pharaoh goes to Moses and says, all right, pr- pray to God. And, and God relents. I mean, God pulls back. And so, you know, there's a great level of grace that shows up. And, and, and we can see sometimes where we think Pharaoh is getting some traction and then where he's not. And, and we can make all kind of psychoanalysis and, and whatnot about what it would be like to be in his shoes. And that might be helpful to at least understand at least Pharaoh as a whole. Um, but he is given choices. Just like Moses and, and you know, uh, and uh, all of us are. Um, I mean, that to some degree, that is a privilege and a price of being human. Uh, and uh, we are responsible beings, uh, which means that we recognize moral values uh, to some degree. Uh, and we're called to make responsible choices. And, and given the opportunity and the obligation to live in the light of the foreseeable consequences of our actions. That is one of the things that separates humans from the animal kingdom. I mean, you're, you're not just the, whatever is the, 
uh, I mean, you, you're able to see process, and part of the process is the consequences of your actions. And, and, and the price we pay uh, is that every choice, whether good or evil, goes to fashion our character. All right, so just, all right, uh, the, the price we pay to, as moral, responsible beings who can see and process, and part of that processing is the consequences of our actions. The price we pay for all of that uh, is that in every choice that we make, either good or evil, goes to fashion our character. All right? And so in, in both short terms and long terms, we are given choices. To use James' language, when he talks about how do we get to sin, you know, James, when, when the book of James describes sin, he doesn't just say, well, sin's that, that's it, here it is. He starts first with the heart. And it's, it's you know, there's a long, there's a little process. Starts with the heart or, or you know, it, it sees some things, it, it begins to process some things, and then finally it, it decides to act on it and it acts on it, it acts on it and, it and acts on it some more, and eventually it leads to sin, and then eventually it leads to death. Uh, Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, they don't just all of a sudden show up and they can't eat of the one tree. There's a process that took place. The whole conversation with the serpent. All right, there's, you know, uh, look at the fruit. Or no, actually, before you even look at the fruit, it's don't you want to be like God? Okay, well, then look at the fruit. This is the means by, this is the method by which you can, you can achieve it. And then it says, you know, they look at it, they like it, they like the fruit looks good. Uh, whether that's the fruit or whether that's the, the end game if I eat the fruit. You know, I think you could make a case for either way. But then they eat it, all right? And so both of those are just examples of um, that we as human beings, uh, and, and we're created this way, okay? This is not a neg, and this is not a negative thing. This is, this is uh, you know, I would argue it's, it, you know, and the psalmist says you're created just lower than the angels. Well, this is part of that. You, you are given an opportunity. It's a privilege. Uh, and, and, but it, come, it can come with consequences. Uh, and so the decisions, the choices that we make, we can make it more than one, uh, the choices that we make lead to some degree of habits or uh, behaviors. You can use whatever word you want. Uh, and and they, they can be good or evil, okay? See it like a path, like you're walking a journey. And eventually, the journey doesn't lead to the dancing with the stars, by the way. It can, but, uh, um, but it, it can eventually, it eventually forms who you are, character. Now, in Exodus, we don't have a word that talks about character so what it uses is the word heart. But that's a good analogy. I mean, that's what you find inside the larger version of Scripture, heart as the, uh, you know, the organ that, uh, that eventually would reflect character or type of person that we are. I mean, there, there's multiple. I mean, we can, you can use another word if, if you like. That's okay. Yeah, well, it starts with... Uh, that's fine. I'll just, we'll just go right to it. Um, uh, I think that's a different one, but that's the same concept. Let me, my Bible, uh, my books are not in the same order because it's falling apart. And so it takes me a while to find them. They're just kind of stuck in there. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, this is part of Corinthians and Galatians and James and everything else. So they're just kind of stuck in there. Um, just give me a minute. It's in, I think, the first chapter. If someone, uh, okay, here we go. Uh, it's in chapter one. Um, here we go, uh, verse 12. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such 
uh, one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. That's a summary statement of uh, basically James gives you the summary of what uh, uh, the end game and then he's going to talk, then he's going to elaborate on it. Uh, so instead of giving you uh, all the points and then coming to a summary, he, he reverses the argument. So he just gave you what he's about to talk about. No one then, or no one when tempted should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself tempts no one. But here it is in verse 14. But one is tempted by one's own desire. All right, so there's the start, which means that inside is not whole. And so, but it acknowledges, it, it's a, it, what, what is implied in this is that people have a choice, okay, to do good or evil. They're tempted by one's own desire. Well, there could be a desire to do good. There could be a desire to do evil. One being lured and enticed by it. Then, which means a continued on process, then when that desire has conceived, so it would imply processing, it then gives birth to sin, action. And then that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived. Now, what I think, I would argue what James, in, uh, I think James has described this process using different terms. All right? You have uh, inside of you, I mean, be, be honest. Are there not inside of you desires to want to do good, and then there are times when there might be desires to not be? Correct? All right? So, you, and that, that, is, that is being completely fully human, okay? And, and that's part of uh, the way that, that we are created. That's a good thing, that we have this, this privilege and this ability, this power. Um, but it does come with consequences, which means when, when we exercise what God has given us, the ability to choose for good, it leads to good, ha which, good habits, which is why spiritual disciplines are really important. All right? Do, do you know, I mean, the reason why any period of time when you look at the church and the preaching and the teaching throughout the entire church's history, and get, get bigger than the church, go back in the Old Testament, even in, 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 the, in, in Judaism, disciplines are given as a gift, not as an obligation. I mean, don't raise your hands, but how many of us see it as an obligation? I have to do this. You're starting in the wrong place. Disciplines are given for a reason to create this, holy habits. And here's the thing, in, in every other, for lack of better words, discipline in life, okay, whether it be sports, whether it be education, whether it be occupation, profession, things of that nature. I mean, we have, we have no problem with this. Practice makes perfect, right? Well, what are you doing? You're, you're forming a, a habit inside of whatever avenue it is, whether it be work, whether it be sports, whether it be education. I mean, you know, what have you? Um, and the idea is that if I practice it enough, I will become an expert, more proficient, better, whole in that area. Correct? All right. How many of y'all watched the, the championship basketball game last night? We got a few. All right. There's a reason why when the game's on the line, the guy can step up and hit, you know, uh, three feet behind the three-point line and he drains it. Well, what we did, what the comment, commentators didn't say is, well, this guy has been practicing since he was five years old. How many thousand shots ha has he taken over his life? For what reason? So that one, he would learn the right technique to shoot. How many times in practice, how many times in previous games have they done that at the last second so that anxiety levels would be down, emotional levels, you know, so that, you know, he, he can make the shot, okay? And, you know, and there's, a, there's and that's just, we do anything. I mean, we practice, uh, how many sentences have you read your entire life 
For what reason? So you can learn to read. All right? Uh, you know, think back to when you were a little girl. For some, that's a little bit further back than others. That's all right, you know. Uh, just give it a shot, you know. So, uh, hadn't seen you in two weeks, so I mean, you know. Uh, but but it, but I mean, you know, there's you know there's there's a reason for that. For what reason? So you can you can learn to read. And so when you you know when you. Uh, when you were a little girl and you hated that, all those times they made you sit and read, well, you know, probably not the same now. It's been so long, I don't remember. That's exactly right. Yeah, good answer. <laughs> Fantastic. For those that are watching, she said it's been so long she can't remember. So, uh, but uh, um, it creates a habit. Over time, that habit becomes part of your character. And let, let's go back to Easter. Now, you, you came to church uh, or, or whatever church that you're part of uh, on Easter Sunday. Why? Because one, that was probably part of your habit. Maybe another word we might use is tradition or culture. It's part of who you are. But you probably didn't approach it with, gosh, I got to do this again. <laughs> Maybe you did. I don't know. Uh, or, or it could have been... I mean, I, I, there's, there's a reason why I want to be here. And there's a, that's exactly right. And there's, there's a, my, the celebratory nature behind it all. Well, that's part of your character. Um, and and there, I mean, there are a ton of things. I mean, you won't do certain things now because it's had this long list of choices made, hundreds, maybe thousands of them. It's become now a habit for you that you do it secondhand. You don't even think about it, and, and, and it become it's part of your character. And so, uh, I mean, when people, you, got, you have children that says, well, Mom, I know you're not going to do this. <laughs> right? Well, what do they mean? I know your character. Or the converse. I expected you to do that, Mom, or Grandmom, or what, you know, whatever. Uh, why? Well, that's part of my, who I am. And so, you know, those can be, they can spiral up. And they can spiral down. Over time, now, what we haven't talked about, it, we've only looked at it from the aspect of, you know, all 100% of human endeavor. What is also mixed into this, where's my eraser? Okay. What's also mixed into this is that God, God is active in all of this, Okay. God is active in the choice. God is active in forming the habit. God is active in forming the heart or the character. Um, you know, to the degree that which God is active, uh, um, you know, whether it's 100% God or 100%, you know, human, you know, that's kind of where we're at. And, you know, uh, both of these you can find in the scriptures. And so somewhere probably in between here lies how it works. Not, you know, not where God leaves you without any influence, but not that God will violate your will. So probably somewhere in between. Now, if Pharaoh makes choices to act and be a certain way which over time forms a habit eventually it will lead to his heart or his character being a certain way and because it involves both God and human and a part of this it is correct to say Pharaoh hardened his own heart and it is correct to say that his heart was hardened. And it is correct to say that God hardened his heart. Does that make sense? If you look at it from this way back, we see that his heart is hardened. Right? Well, how did it become hardened? Well, there are times where Pharaoh was doing it. And there was times that God allowed him to live into his own character he was creating. 
And so you get all three of these in the text, and they're not in conflict. Does that make sense? Word as in word of God, spoken word of God as in scripture. Tell me, okay, which one are you? Okay. Sure. So when Moses brought the word of God mm-hmm. to Pharaoh, the word of God has an effect. Whenever we are presented with the word of God, whether it is hearing the word right. Um, right, the influence side. Word, right. Or Jesus mm-hmm. with the Holy Spirit. Whenever the word of God comes to our heart, it's going to have some kind of impact. Either we are going to harden our heart to that word, or we're going to um, receive that sure. word. Sure, sure. And so, to me, that again speaks to how, somehow, it, God works in all mm-hmm. that. And so, it, you know, there are a lot of things we can face in life that aren't necessarily, I guess, in, in our choices, don't have greater consequences. Right. But the word of God, whenever presented, is so powerful that it's going to have an effect on the heart. Either the person will harden their heart or the word itself will harden that person's heart because they refuse to receive it. Right, as, a, as a causation of not receiving it. Right. The, uh, um, Wesley would, would uh, we, Wesley uses, he doesn't use the word of God. He, he uh, John Wesley would, would use the phrase, the Word of God, almost exclusively for Scripture. But to use, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use, I'm going to introduce a, another phrase, prevenient grace, or different types of grace. Same grace, different ways of describing it. Prevenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace. Same concept, though. The idea of God's presence, God's Word, God's activity um, allows us to, to see certain things. Uh, like, for instance, prevenient grace is if you can imagine, you're going to have to stay with me here, uh, I can't see everything that's going on in the room, correct? I can only see just a little bit. Prevenient grace allows me to see a little bit to at least know what God is doing, all right? The moment I walk through the door, my sight changes, and I'm now inside. I'm not fully inside, but I'm inside the door. The way we describe what Patty's talking about, the Word of God or God's activity, justifying grace. I now have been exposed, to, and I have, I've made steps to go with that, to the larger kingdom of God's activity. When I walk in, and I continue to walk and move and act and breathe and, and live inside of this room, to use that analogy, I'm living inside of God's kingdom and the same grace, different term, sanctifying grace, is forming my character. Now, all of these have been active. God has been active. We, we, we've just parsed for our understanding to, to God's activity before the choice, at the moment the choice is happening, and then the constant work with God of those choices to form our character. Does that make sense? And so you can describe it in terms of, uh, great point by the way, you can describe it in terms of God's grace, and there are terms, I mean, Word of God, Book of Hebrews, uh, there there are other phrases or words that, that describe God's activity, but the idea is that it is not 100% just our endeavor, and, and it's not, Thanks be to God, it is not something that God just forces down and says, this is the way it's going to be. Part of the way that we are created, and this is in just the awe and the genius of the creating God that we follow. We're created this way that, that where God gives you privilege and power. And your privilege and power makes a difference. It makes a difference in, in what you become 
And it makes a difference, I mean, we can get even larger, into the world. Think about what, you know, we don't, and we can make, we can go down this rabbit trail if you want. Think about the choices that are made by Pharaoh or by Moses that led to habit and eventually led to character and then how that influences large masses of people. I mean, we, we don't really spend any time around this with the Exodus, uh, but we could. I mean, you can do the same thing with, um, you know, Sunday sermon. It's amazing how all this stuff kind of weaves together. Sunday we're going to talk about the, the, the role of friendship in how that leads to uh, building up or tearing down, uh, to use the terms that we're using here. And, uh, and we're going to look at Paul's life specifically with Ananias, who's a bit player, it sounds like, in the book of Acts. But if you really think about what Ananias did for Paul, bingo, you said he saved him. Uh, now, we don't know what would have happened without Ananias' faithfulness. And you still got to come on Sunday, okay? So this isn't a free pass, all right? <laughs> um, you know, uh, but Paul is at a point where he's right here. And and I would even argue he's very vulnerable because what he's known to be true has now just, there's been an earthquake and it's been swallowed up. And so he's faced with, who who am I? What am I going to do? What am I going to be about? And his reputation is fearful for Christians. And so, I mean, you just put yourself in Ananias' place for a moment. It takes so much it takes so much faith and obedience to do what Ananias did, all right? To you, now to go back to our context here, I would argue that Ananias probably, and I'm just, I don't know for sure, so I'm giving you a, a, an, an argument based on probability. I would argue that if Ananias was not in a place where he had formed holy habits that led to a character he would not, one, have known what to do from God because he wouldn't have been in a place to hear from God. And two, definitely would not have had the, the courage, to use another word, the faith, the trust, to act in the way that he did. And yet, all, you know, he is mentioned for a handful of verses and then he's gone. Because what Luke is doing in, his, in, in Luke and Acts, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were one book originally. All right, and so you know the church in editing has split up the two. So in Luke's gospel, the second half, what Luke is doing is setting the stage, not to say that Paul is one of the twelve. He wasn't chosen as one of the twelve, but he's setting the stage for what Paul would become and eventually do in mission work. And so Ananias's role as a friend. Is beyond. I mean, it's more than critical. And, and so, you know, what would we, you know, and I'm not going to stop here because I'll get into my sermon, but that's right. Uh, so, um, but you see how choices in the way that we are created and with the way that God influences. So God, God is active to some degree, but not in a violation of who you are. Um, Choices can lead to habit and ultimately lead to character. Now, this is a process, and that over time, uh, but over time, it does create something. Do you have your hand up, or was that? Uh, uh, um, it, 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 it creates who we are. And then, you know, and then it creates, I mean, then what happens is there's this circular type effect where the more your character is formed, the more it then influences your choices. And then when you flip back, what do you mean by flip back? Sure. Well, um, Or 
Well, see, see it as in the character is not fixed permanently. The character is always, if you can imagine, well, to use the Old Testament language, uh, clay being molded, okay? Um, you can take the clay and throw it down, and it just is a glob. And then, but the more you mold it, even though it's not fixed, you still can get a genuine, gen, a genuine picture of what, what, what's being created, right? If I'm going to make a bowl, you know, after a little bit of moving, you're going to see that it's, it's probably going to be a bowl, right? Now, you don't know what it's going to look like when it's fired, if it's going to be colored or whatnot, and, you know, what, what's going to happen when all the water is removed, but, but you can get a general picture. Well, the more... The, you know, the more the clay is molded, the easier or the clearer the picture becomes of what the product will be. But then, but then at the same time, I could have it almost finished and introduce something, and it could wreck it. All right? And I have to go back and start over. And, and so this is not a fixed state, okay? But it can feed on itself. That's, that's part of the, the lesson here. Mm -hmm. But not evil always goes for the escape. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you think about that, I mean, that can happen to everybody. Sure. But you've got to be watching mm -hmm. for that escape. That's right. And you've got to make that choice to take it. Mm -hmm. That goes from your character back to your choice, right? Right. Well, yeah, that's what I mean by it's not <laughs> fixed. Um, you know, for instance, if you go back to the James text, let me turn back to that. Um, uh, James 1, hang on, right, right, what, what Becky's saying is, is the, the heart or the character is like soil, one, one decision does not make this, now obviously there are, there are decisions that, this is my term, are, are more weighted, Okay, uh, um, they, they do determine, uh, you know, those are larger bets that are placed, to use a card game analogy, uh, to where they will have a larger outcome, but one, one decision does not determine everything um, because, th I mean, this is not fixed, this is fluid. And so, to, to use both uh, Pat and Becky's comments, but one is tempted by one's own desire, okay? Uh, and then being lured and, and enticed by it. That, that will always be there. That, that's part, that is, that I would argue is the, uh, we haven't talked about just the role of sin, but now we're going to bring in some other theological issues. The, the effects of sin just in general changes, uh, I mean, just uh, the heart always will want the preset place for the heart is to want to be in control, all right? And so part of the character that wants to be formed by God is to change that, all right? Now, I don't think that, you know, I would argue theologically that change is not fixed uh, until the by and by, all right? I mean, you know, so uh, that will be a battle that is always fought. Um, but the, the volume of the voice that wants to entice doesn't always have to be as loud as it is. Which means the more choices are made for God, the more habits are made for God, the more one's character becomes in the image of Christ which means that the temptation doesn't go away. Even Christ was tempted, even at the very end, all right? And so, but the, the ability to recognize the voice. What does he say in John? My sheep know my voice, okay? Which means that there's going to be a first time in that just one individual life hearing the voice for the first time, all right? Well, that, that might not be as clear. But the more, go back to, uh, you know, go back to your children. When you say their name now, when you call their name, they're not wondering, is she talking to me? <laughs> well, maybe they are, you know, so. But, I mean, they, listen, it's been, it's been habitual. They know, 
All right? Same thing with God. And so, uh, but the, the, because we're created this way, the choices, I mean, they're, they're going to, there's always going to be the playing field for the choice. Um, and, you know, and then privilege and power, okay, comes with an opportunity to, in the hearing of the voice, both for good or for bad, to choose good and to have that form that in you. All right? But it's not fixed. One thing that comes to my mind is, is what Joanne said is, does this go back to the spiritual discipline? Sure. That the more we do grow, the more they become mm-hmm. in our lives, the more we can hear his voice. That's right. And, and, uh, and, and the, the lower... The, to use the voice here, the, the one, the voice that the, the accuser of the brethren, to use the Revelation text, that voice uh, decreases. I mean, but it's still there. I mean, you, you know, there, there, there'll, there'll still be, you know, in, you might process it so fast that it might seem automatic, but the, the, the temptation's still there. Uh, someone does something to you, you formed a character, one of forgiveness. Well, you might go from witnessing the event to processing the event to forgiveness so quick because that's your character all right but that doesn't mean that the the you know the temptation wasn't there and the choice wasn't there you've just formed a character that is starting to feed on itself towards good or or or, you know or the other you know event happens and there's the choice of choosing forgiveness, to use that example, or choosing something else. You might choose something else because that's the character that's been formed and, and you immediately dismiss the voice that says, hey, there's a different way. To use that Corinthian example, you bypass that little place in the mountain that's your exit ramp so quick because you weren't paying attention and the next thing you know, you're on down the highway. All right? Well, I mean, but you know, if you go back and stop it, put it in slow motion, they were there. You know, you just formed a character that says, I'm not going to do that. And we do that. I mean, you know, and, 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 that's, and we do that, uh, you know, you got to realize we've, we've stopped, we've slowed the process down to analyze it. We, we can go from choice to character so fast now. Uh, you know, um, you leave here and somebody's not paying attention because they're texting and they almost hit your car. <laughs> think about how fast. Think of, pardon me? Well, I mean, think, but, but think about how fast you go from witnessing the event, processing the event, form thoughts. I mean, in your mind, like the, you know, 15 different ways. I can blow the horn. I can dismiss it. I can drive on their tail real fast, I can, you know, I can be mad and talk about it for the rest of the day, and, you know, I mean, you know, I can put a Facebook post and hope that that puts a zinger, I mean, you know, there's a million of these we've processed so fast, like it's, I mean, but think about it, within what, a second? All right, so I mean, you know, so we, we've just stopped the process to put it on the table to look at it, you know, uh, and, and to, and to analyze and slow the process down. But some of these, you know, we, we make these decisions so fast and so quick. And, you know, part of what I think God does on the good, when, it, when we're choosing good, I mean, that's, that, that forms that character, that's fantastic. Uh, but one of the things I think that God influences the process when we're choosing down or choosing evil is to slow us down a bit. So we can actually see what's going on inside of us. Some of you mentioned the uh, the little the prayer path, and I know we're we're late for a break. We're going to take a break, uh, but let's just finish this real quick. The the prayer path that we had here during Holy Week, or the contemplative service, that, that is a discipline that is designed to slow you down, and it doesn't deal so much with what's going on around the world. That is a part of it because we are relational people. We're not just one dimension. But the real, the, the goal of those disciplines are, are, are not the journey outside, it's the journey inside. And so whether it be reading a text, Word of God, Scripture, well, you focus on it. 
and you stay there for a long time of silence. And, and the, the, you know, contemplative service, when you introduce the Scripture, you read the Scripture, Lexio Divinia, divine word. You read the Scripture, and whatever word or phrase pops into your mind, you stay there. And forget the rest of the passage. Just stay there. Allow God to use that first impression to stay there for a moment. And then to, to reflect on it, to chew it up over and over and over and over and over. Uh, and, and to see what happens. Uh, you know, uh, if you're praying for yourself, and you know, most of us have been taught to pray, that we need to pray for other people. Well, that's great. It is. But if you think that's what prayer means, you've only scratched the surface. I mean, often, if you want to help somebody else, you deal with yourself. The highest way of love is, is I love you because I am whole and complete. And I offer a whole and complete self to you. As compared because I, I love you because I need something. Or you need something. Does that make sense? Bernard of Clairvaux, if you want to read on that, that's, that's his work. Like 14th century, I think, maybe, French. Um, but, I mean, that, that's uh, uh, often, if you want to benefit people who are close to you, work on yourself. That's not selfish. I mean, how does, what's the mean? And so this is where the church just bombs it. We do, we do a horrible job with this. We think love means we've got to go out and be codependent. That's, that's, I mean, go back and listen to old sermons. Hopefully, you know, not from us, but, you know, go, go back in your mind or, or dig them up. Sermons about love. It, what, we, what we talk about is co our service. We, 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 we describe them in codependency. Uh, you, something's wrong with you, so you've got to go and do something or be something, and that's going to make you whole. But you start from an idea that I don't have it, so I need, a, I need a host that I can go and be like a tick and get, get something out of it. And, and so that's, you know, we describe service and love that way. And, and yet when Jesus describes love, what is the means, what is the entire method filter by which you are to see, treat, and care for other people? What is it? No, no, no. Say it louder. That's exactly right. And if you're not taking care of yourself, and if you don't love yourself, and you see yourself, if you see yourself as deficient, then you're going to oversee somebody else, or you're going to undersee them. Does that make sense? And, and you know, so what is written in, what is, what is un, the undercurrent behind Jesus' teaching is, if you really want to love somebody else, you sure need to understand how to love yourself. Well, how many of you start, no show of hands, with the idea that you really do love yourself? That's a, in our culture here in the United States, Western culture, that is something that you have to learn. Because what our culture teaches you is that there's something wrong with you first, and you've got to go and do something or achieve it. Once you do that, then you can love yourself. That is wrong. And you cannot find that in the Bible. What humility? What is humility? What? And, and I mean, uh, as if to say, let me ask some other questions. Is it to say, if loving myself and caring for myself, does that mean I'm not humble? Is that what you're asking? Uh, it, it's a one. Sure, okay. Um, I, I would, humility, hu it is. Humility has to deal, do mostly with intent. All right? Humility is not the absence of power. Humility is the full understanding that you've got all types of privilege and power. You just choose to use it differently. Okay? You don't start with, I'm deficient. You start with, I, I've got, I got all kinds of stuff here. Out of, out of, out of a complete self, a whole self, I choose to give. Now that's different from I have to give because in giving it's going to make me whole. Do you see the difference? I mean, 
Still give. I mean, Jesus doesn't say, don't do these things. He just says, make sure you're doing it starting in the right place. I mean, what is the New Testament? I mean, the, the core teaching of the New Testament is that in Christ you're whole. It starts there first. And, and then out of that vat, that completeness, then you go outward. But see, what we do in the church is we, we don't, it's, it's not that we're terrible at it. But in overemphasizing outward actions, we underemphasize inward state. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, and, and you know, and, and hopefully, you know, we're, the good news is that the church has embraced again as as a uh, things like contemplative way of life, monastic type ideas. That's coming back into into flavor, uh, and, and, and I think that's the Holy Spirit, I'm speaking at the church universal, I think that's the Holy Spirit moving the church back towards a more complete understanding of herself. And, and, and if, you, if we don't see this, but I'll tell you, it is worth the investment to take some classes on church history, all right? It's boring, all right, it is, I mean, it's history, okay, I mean, you know, um, well, but, I, but for this reason, you get to see on a large scale how God works in the life of the church universal. And there are times in the history of the church where we move so far to the right that it becomes deadly. All right? Correct theology is good. Go back and read the churches in Revelation. Do you know what the problem is with the first church? In their correct theological belief, they would not love. Because everybody else just doesn't believe the way we do. We're the right ones. And God, may God damn you if you're not right. All right, go back and read the, not my words, huh? It's the Gospel of John. I mean, <coughs> John of Patmos. There are sometimes the church moves so far to the left, all right, that it loses its core theology. Okay, and this could this is you know this is two thousand years of activity. Okay, so if you if you can't get this wide berth of view, you miss how God moves the church back towards center. Orthodoxy and orthopraxy, right belief and right practice. And, you know, what I think is going on is, you know, to use a specific example, the styles of disciplines that have been around the church for a long period of time, but have just fallen out of favor. Just they're not talked about, they're not used, they're not practiced. They're starting to come back, and what they deal with and focus on is inward state. I mean, we, we have a, um, I, I don't know how many people's in here, what, 40, 45 or so? I'm looking at 45 people who know how to serve, all right? I mean, you know, if we were to make a laundry list, we don't need any more sermons on, you need to go and do this. I mean, think about all the things that you are involved in that involve either your, you know, St. Paul, the church you attend, or a parachurch ministry, which, like Open Door, Young Life, Teen Advisors, I mean, uh, uh, all these things that are, that are somehow linked close to the church, and, and they have a shared goal. And there's levels of, you know, God thought or God belief inside of it. I mean, you know, you're... Get out your calendar. I mean, I bet three days a week, seriously, probably revolves around that in your life. Okay? I mean, so you don't need any more service sermons, service teaching. You're already doing that. But now, how many of you would say on the inside, it's all good? That's where you start. I mean, that's, that's what you deal with. So my advice 
without sitting down and talking one-on-one, -on -one, my advice is you don't need to do everything. Stop it. Seriously. Let somebody else do it, okay? They can do it. Might take a little bit that, you know, you have to maybe help some people move into that. Spend more time dealing with the inside. And that's harder work. Because it'll force you to be by yourself and deal with the things that, I mean, there, there's a reason why our culture, our church culture, runs on service. Because if I can be so busy, I surely don't have to pay attention with what's on the inside. I can run myself ragged. Clergy aren't the only ones who burn out, friends. Because we make choices. And our choices will eventually lead to habits. And they will form our character. And, and if we are not cultivating an inward love for Jesus, that even if I didn't serve, I will still love Him. Then, then you're just... Hear me on this. I don't mean it exactly the way I'm going to say it, but I'm going to say it to prove a point. We might be just as guilty as doing, making a bad decision, even in a good way. Uh, sure it is. I mean, let, um, what's interesting to me, this is, I fight this demon too, okay? And then, uh, all right, we, then the last one, I promise we're going to break. What's interesting to me is this. Jesus did not have any guilt leaving people in need to go away for a period of prayer and meditation and inward focus. Go back and read the Gospels. Well, let's get up and go. Well, there's other people that need to be fed. I understand that. We're going to the other side. How dare he? Oh, sure. That's what I'm saying. We, 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 we've done, we, I say we collectively, all of us, have, have done, you know, we, we have sacrificed the inward state for outward actions. All right, that's good, all right, in one sense, because it is helping others, all right? Um, but at some point, you're going to reach that tipping point to where you're burning reserves on the inside. And if you burn them long enough, the inside becomes, uh, becomes hollow. Well, when that happens, be smart. Listen to the Spirit it is okay to say, I'm not going to do this for a season, right? You're not going to hurt my feelings, okay? You won't. There are other people who can do it. But now, for this caveat that you're working on the inside, it's okay. So, you know, I'm telling somebody, so in the fall, I think we're going to start a, a contemplative service on Wednesday nights in line with some of the other things that we do on Wednesday nights. It's not to be competitive, it's not, but I mean, it's the idea that there might be some people that, you know, a handful or whatever that, you know, after supper want to go and to work on inward state. So we're going to design some act, you know, some, some worship around that. Yeah, I mean, no, it's, and it's only going to be for a period of time. It's not going to be, you know, it, but, but it's... Sure. Well, well, there'll be something there after a while of inward state. What'll happen is you'll get antsy because you feel like you need to go and act on it. Okay, well, go out, do outward service. You know, uh, maybe in the process you find that right balance where you're feeding on the inside and you're feeding on the outside. It just doesn't have to be either or. That's the thing. You, you live, you act out of your inward state. Well, if you're not tending to the inward state, then, you know, it, it'll die. Somewhere years ago, I was taught that if I was given an opportunity to do something in God's name, if I didn't do it, I just give me the blessing and God can get somebody else to do it. Well, then that takes you up in this competition of, well, I don't want somebody else to get my blessing, you know, so you're right. We have been yeah. honest. Yeah, and I, I would, uh, now I'll just tell you, there's, there's a part of me that just goes, oh. Uh, <laughs> when we start talking about blessings that are mine and blessings that are others and take, I understand, I, listen, I, there's, a whole, there's a whole level of theology that personally I think is borderline heresy. Uh, pr prosperity gospel. Uh, 
uh, you know, and for on channel 237 on the XM, you can go and listen to it every day. Uh, yeah. Uh, and and I, I think that's, uh, that starts, um, we'll tackle this after the break. Cause I mean, uh, <laughs> take, take 10 minute break.
All right, let's go ahead and uh, um, come back to order. <coughs> All righty, uh, you should have a copy of the uh, prayer list. I've got a few extras up here if you did not receive one. And uh, um, so we'll, we'll pick back up. Uh, Wow. Um, yeah, it's a good thing I passed out that one sheet that we were going to actually fill in. Um, yeah, exactly right. So uh, uh, I do want to spend just a moment around uh, um, this whole concept of what is uh, what inside theological circles we call prosperity gospel. And... Uh, that, that's a term you might or might not be familiar with that, and that's. Uh, but but it, it's of it's been around. It's not just a modern uh, view of theology or a mo- modern development. I mean, it's been been around the church f- for a while. I mean, you can find elements of this uh, in in a number of different areas. Uh, I, I'm going to give you my perspective and. Uh, so, I mean, just treat it with an asterisk. I mean, you're getting a lot of, I mean, you're getting my theological reflection. So, I mean, it's not where it, it's, it's not absent of Bible or absent of theological thought or absent of church history and tradition. Um, but but I, I think it's dangerous if, if we're not careful because it can create a slippery slope, so, which is why I said it's borderline or, or half uh, um, and my, at least my perspective of the modern view of this is that it, the slippery slope falls pretty quick. And, and so, and it can be, uh, it, it can be a little damaging to, to people uh, if we're not careful. What I mean by prosperity gospel is that um, Jesus becomes the ticket, all right? And that faith then becomes a means by which uh, to receive blessing. Uh, but the way blessing is described uh, is not in terms of beatitudes, blessed. Okay, uh, um, it's described often in uh, absence of pain in life or hardship and financial gain. And that, when it goes there is where you've, we've tipped over on the slippery slope. And uh, uh, because when we, when, we tip, when we tip over, you know, if this is the point by which we tip over, we move into a very me-dominated view of theology, God, and the world, and not a god dominated or centered theology to look at it differently would be here if faith is the means by which for you to be blessed and i'm emphasizing the you the center behind your theological construct the center behind the intent of your actions is for you to receive all right does that make sense so you do something in order to get something and the real reason why you're doing it is to get something. That is pagan in its understanding. All right? When you read in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it talks about when you have the, you have the you know, God-oriented, pagan-oriented, their worldview is this way where there's not a, a difference between, between what is divine and what is not divine. What is create or what is creator and what is created? It's all mixed together, okay. And so, what the person must do is figure out the right means by which to pull the divine lever, so you open up the divine world for you. Magic. Think about magic. I have the right incantation. I do the right thing. I say the right thing. I can get the desired end because I'm tapping into the, to the divine world. Does that make sense? Which is why in the Old Testament, and you have 
magicians and pagans and things like that, they're all, a lot of times they're listed in the same sentence. It is to describe a worldview that is me dominated and I can work the system to get what I want, even if the system is God. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Prosperity gospel flirts with this line. Okay? You, God wants you to be blessed. And, and it's often described as that's the whole purpose for God. That is not the purpose for God. Not even close to the purpose of God. God exists for God's own, because of God's own will. The fact that we are included in this is just a wonder of God. That's exactly right. But let me tell you who God operates first for. God. All right? Which is why he's, when, when, when the scriptures say he's a jealous God, that's not negative. That's just setting the bar where it should be set. He doesn't exist for us. Uh, Presbyterians. Any Presbyterians? Uh, sort of. The first, first, what's the Westminster Confession? Remember the, remember the, the shorter catechism? What is it? Say it. All right. That's exactly right. The whole, the whole existence for humanity is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. It is not the whole existence for God is to joy humanity and then enjoy them forever. It is not, nor will it ever, be tilted toward where all of faith is about you and what happens to you and, and, and tapping in and getting something from God. The fact that we get something from God is just an after effect. It is not where we start. And so when the church begins to frame everything in this type of language, we really are just worshiping ourselves. Which is why I have a big problem with it. Because it sounds so good. All right? It does. It sounds, I mean, and, and who doesn't want no pain? Who doesn't want, uh, who doesn't want blessing? All right? And so then when it, gets, when it gets elaborated on, it starts to talk about, you know, I've got to get my blessings. <laughs> what is that? I mean, is it just a, is this up in, you know, I mean, I've even heard it in heaven, you know, you got your name on it and there's, you know, we tell these stories, you know, there's a room, it's got all these presents in it. When you get to heaven, you're going to walk in there and realize that you did not do certain things to get what was designed for you. Really? Where is that at? I mean, you know, I'm serious. This is, go back and listen to, you know, just pull it. Uh <laughs> Crowns in heaven is an image that is used to describe just living with God. Uh, you don't have crowns here. And so, you know, being in heaven, it, the, the way Revelation describes heaven is uh, in a comparison language with what's going on now. All right? And, and so that when, when with God fullness, all right, without limitations, it is described as perfection. All right, well, the only way, how would you describe perfection? All right, I mean, what, what are some of the ways? How do you describe perfect love? Big diamond, right? I mean, okay, so you got diamond, all right? Gold, strip, I mean, fry, okay, well, you know, if, 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 if Becky's writing the book of Revelation, it'd be fried chicken. So, I mean, you know, uh, um, well, it describes eating, feasting at table, you know, uh, Plenty of food, plenty of drink, plenty of, you know, uh, there, there's, there's nothing that's lack of. And so uh, you, you see the, the now and the, the not yet aspect of heaven, aspect of the fullness of kingdom of God in the not yet understanding of that, as in when, when the not yet becomes the fullness or becomes the reality, we enjoy God in His fullness. Okay, well, how do you describe that? I mean, if you're a person, okay, well, you, you, can, you, you, you have to describe it in means and terms by which you know. Well, I mean, you know, if we were going to describe it 
in our lifetime, you know, it might be fried chicken, you know, or whatever. Grits and eggs for me, okay, I like that, you know. But, I mean, but you, you understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm being a little... Well, but, but, but in our society, how would you describe perfect? No flaws, okay, no flaws. Well, put, all right, all right. No, seriously, if you're going to write a letter to this group about what perfect reality would be, how would you do that? No flaws, that's it? That's the only thing we're going to put? I mean, you know. Right, I mean, you know, so you get this terminology that says, you, you know, uh, no flaws, no lacking, things of full, you know. And so when you read, when, when you read terminology in the New Testament about heaven, uh, I mean, it is described in those types of terms, okay? And, and the idea is, Compare that with what it is now. And so, I mean, now heaven, you have a now and a not yet component. And so when we describe the not yet component, it is in stark contrast to what we have now. All of it is seen in that you are enjoying the fullness of God forever. Now, if that is literal crowns, okay, maybe... I mean, but there's plenty of information that says that that's the, that's the only way that John, that's the best way that John could describe what it means. People who don't have anything, they have something. They have what? They have the epitome of what it means to be a king or a queen. Right. So, I mean, it's not mine. Okay. All right. Stay with there. Okay. So, that's exactly right. All right. When, when it's this, though... It's my crown. All right? Okay, well, but you can't in, in that level of understanding, that level of theology. Sure. All right, li listen, again, this is not either or. All right, don't, don't make the, that's why I said it's half. All right? There, there, you can talk about blessing, a blessed life. You can talk about, you know, what, what we do receive when we live in, in God's will, when we live in God's kingdom. That's fine, okay? But why are we living in God's kingdom? Or why do we do what we do? Is it because ultimately God's my meal ticket? Or is it because I'm living in this kingdom with God and my culture, I mean, my character is being transformed. So I want to do it as an act of love, not because I really want to get something. Those are different. And so it's, it's not that everything that shows up in what we call prosperity gospel is bad. It's just when it moves past that tempting point and it says, you know, it's really about me because the construct there has changed. What is at the center is no longer God, it's me. And so why I do something is really because my intent is because I want to receive something. Well, what the scriptures say is that you can be obedient to God and not receive anything. Sometimes it rains on the just as well as it rains on the unjust. Mm. Right. Sure. That's right. I mean, it, that tipping point, that's exactly right. There's a tipping point where that takes place. You're 100% right. So it is the seducing spirit, and it's the same seducing spirit that has always been in the world, the evil one. Sure. And, uh, and like you said, it can even have more devastating... Oh, I mean, it can be really, uh, you know, um, to follow in that same line, what happened to the 12 disciples? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right.
And then he said, you know, I know this one thing what happened to the disciples. So on the way over here, I Googled it on my phone, and we all talked about it. And he talked about the difference, what happened to the men that were the closest to Jesus. And we know that John, because Jesus said John did not know mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Now, how does that even compare? That was not, mm-hmm. the, you know, to those who think that, that because you know the Lord, that somehow you're going to be right. excused from sure. all those difficult things in life. Plus, personally, I believe just like, uh, and this is what, and it may not be true, but because God is always with us and He's our comforter, no matter where we are, He always is in the palm of His hand. Right. You know, I don't believe he felt a single stone. I think in, that's just me personally, that because he was so in the spirit with the Lord, right. that the agony that, he, that would have been the agony that he would have experienced was no longer that agony. I just believe that he was so caught up with the Lord and seeing him and keeping his eye on his face, his Jesus' face. So anyway, that's kind of what I'm, I'm thinking when it comes to the but yes, those yeah, I mean, Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, if you want to do some more study on the martyrs of the early church, long list, the disciples are listed. So, blessed, you know, in the disciple, I mean, they, um, Peter, to use another disciple, uh, the, the, we don't know, as in written down in, in the Bible, but there are writings that talk about how that when Peter died, the, there's persecution in Rome, everybody's leaving, he has a vision that sees Christ. And the idea is Christ is saying, or he looks at Christ and says, where are you going? He says, well, I'm going back in with my people. And so Peter turns around and goes back in, he's martyred, and he says, I'm, I'm not worthy to be, so he's crucified upside down. Um, so, but the idea is, you know, inside, you still can be blessed, all right, even you know, uh, in, in life. Um, but it just might not be money or no pain or things of that nature. And, and that is where, when it moves towards it's about me more than it is about God, then we have, we have passed that tipping point. And, and that can be Marcion was uh, one of the early, I mean, he was actually one of the first persons to collect uh, canonized scripture uh, in the early church. He's also one of the first heretics because he moved into a role of a quasi version of prosperity gospel uh, under the role of the Holy Spirit. And you know, if you're with the Holy Spirit, then you're going to get all these goody things. And and so the church said, no, that's you know, that's that's close to being right, but it's not 100 percent accurate. And, and so, why do you do it? The intent it's important. Who are you doing it for? Are you doing it for yourself, or is it you know? Are you doing it because you belong to God, and and, and if if something good comes out of that, uh, you know whether it's good or bad, it rains on the just and the unjust. Now, what Patty was talking about, I, I think, it has uh, uh, so th- there is something to the idea that what God's presence provides is not an ease of life, but whatever comes your way, His presence with you. All right. So that's but that's but listen, that's different than the idea of you you got to get your blessing. I understand it is. So I mean, you can use the same term terminology. Right. Sure. So right, and so when we talk about uh, this one's gone, when we talk about sin. Are blessing, and so often they're used in, in dichotomies uh, in in this line of thought. Um, uh, blessing becomes more of uh, someone mentioned temporal. I heard that, uh, or or something that you strive after. 
uh, sin is described as not receiving a blessing. Well, you know, at not receiving blessing in terms of it being something physical or something along those lines. And most of the time, it ends up in described in pain-free existence or in financial gain. And that's, that's again where we're moving to the temporal point. Don't, listen, don't see that, I mean, there's, they have the same terminology, okay? They'll mention, I mean, we'll mention faith, we'll mention God, we'll mention sin, we'll mention blessing, we'll mention grace, we'll mention all these things. It's just the definition behind the terms are different. And, and that's where it can become confusing and can even become destructive because it, it, it'll, it moves from an existence where God is the core or the center, center, center of the circle, to you or me or a human being being the center behind it all. And they are two vastly different things. And, and so even in quasi-spiritual Christian you, you know, description, you still can be operating in two different circles. And then we got, we're probably going to have to leave you. All right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We got one more time. Sure. Right. Well, let me. Uh, can can uh, uh, Jean? Oh, okay, okay, different. Okay, different. Um, I, I got you. All right. So, uh, what she said was that uh, the temporary, the blessing is temporary. Is that right? Yeah, the me-centered understanding is the blessing is, uh, yeah, it's always temporary. It's never forever, uh, and more. I think you said more outward nature uh, in in design. Um, and, and one of the ways, probably a good way to to sum it up, you can be blessed and still be in, you know, in the middle of the hurricane. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, and so. I don't mean the eye, all right, that's supposed to be a peaceful place, you know, but in, in the waves, you know, uh, that, that's a different understanding and a different description, definition of, of being blessed and, uh, you know, why, why, who do you exist for, what's your whole purpose, goal in life, things of that nature, when other way, in the me-centered, the fact that you're in the hurricane would be often described as that you're living outside of blessing. Well, that's, I mean, that's not true. And so, you know, uh, again, say, has same terminology, uh, um, but, but the way they are described and the, and the purpose and the intent behind actions, either from person or from God, they are different. And, you know, and you... You know, when it, when it starts to form towards the idea of, you know, you need in some form or fashion, however it's described, to receive what's yours. Just be careful. All right? It might be 100% thoroughly biblical, okay? But historically, it's moving past the tipping point. And, um, you know, my, my advice is to, you know, to sift through what's being said and is it is it for ultimately God's benefit or is it for your own benefit uh, and if so what are those benefits um, uh, because it, it's it can be uh, it can sound so attractive and uh, and yet it could be a, a good bit away from uh, from living in a kingdom where God is at is the core of it, uh, and I don't don't go away fearful of like oh my gosh what you know is this is this it or not you know, just continue to live and and you know and, and seek to be faithful, uh, but if if there is a constant message or a constant theme that is more seen in something like this just be sensitive to that uh, because it I mean it, it's. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's around. It's very it's uh it's very attractive in today's culture. Um, and it, you know, it's 
Who? Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. The point being is that it, you know, there are days that are better than others. Sure. I don't just God just had everything to do with it today. I'm not so sure about that. He didn't fix my flat tire, but somebody came along. Well, is it is it is your is your good karma dependent upon you giving something? I'm not being. I know he knows that. Right. Yeah. Well, are just good things happening? I mean, you know, it's, karma is a word that shows up in. Uh, uh, I think Hinduism, yeah. So, re- reaping and sowing would be a, another way of describing that. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 well, in, in Christianity, you, you reap what you sow. All right. So, same, same concept um, to some degree. The, the difference is do, do you give so that you will get good karma? You, you know, what's the intent? And uh, um, so, I mean, same, same questions apply. And, uh, uh, um, you know, trace the dots. You know, I mean, uh, there was a wonderful article, I think it was in the AJC, where uh, somebody was writing about, uh, you know, because they do ministry effectively, they needed a new jet. Right? Yeah. Right, and the rationale behind that is I, can, I, the minister, can be in more places at, at faster times so that I can do God's work, okay? Well, listen, I'm all right with that. You know, Brooke and I got to travel some. You know, we, we'll be comfortable like, was it net jets or whatever, you know? Uh, but, uh, but the idea, look, look, look at the pronoun. I will be it around faster so that I can do God's work, all right? So I need you to give to me. All right, go in peace. May the Lord be with you.